Sorry, it's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Vic Houching Jr. Now, Vic is the past president of the Theosophical Society in the Philippines and the Indo-Pacific Federation of the TS. He is also the president of the Golden Link College Foundation, a Theosophical College founded in 2002. And he is the author of the book called The Proce Process of Self-Transformation, Why Meditate, on education and other works. And he compiled and edited the chronological edition of the Mahatma Letters to A.P. Sinnott and is uh, associate edi editor of the Theosophical Encyclopedia. He has conducted the self-transformation seminar in many countries, such as the United States, Australia, New Zealand, India, Brazil, Spain, Israel, Singapore, Mexico, Argentina, and more, and has served as director of the School of the Wisdom in December 2014 and 2015. The title of his talk this morning is Our Work in the 21st Century. Please, will you uh, greet Vic Houchin. Thank you, Jenny. Good morning to all of you. <coughs> this morning, I'm tasked uh, with the subject on looking into our work in the future for the Theosophical Society. And I'd like to share with you some thoughts among many, some thoughts which would play a crucial difference in the future of our society for the next hundred years. A basic question that we all should ask ourselves is, what is our vision for the society in a hundred years' time, by the end of this century? What would we like to see uh, as the Theosophical Society? Now, when we look forward, we need to also look backward, as well as looking at where we are right now. Now, looking backward, the picture has not been a very uh, positive one. There are many, many positive things, but there is one aspect where in which we find that there is some degree of alarm or concern. You'll notice that since 1928, when our membership peaked at about 45,000, it has gradually gone down that up to this time we have about 25,000 members. And this decline has been consistent. And this happened at the same time as the opposite direction of world population growth, which, is, which has tri uh, grown to two and a half times since 1928. So population has ballooned <coughs> and our membership has gone down. And we ask ourselves, what is our role in the world as a theosophical society? Aside from our membership decline, there are many things which seem to have weakened. Our publishing work has also declined, and our magazines are mostly directed to members and not for the public. And there are many, not many young people who join the Theosophical Society today. Now, it has been noted that for 140 years, there is a major emphasis on looking at the teachings uh, elaborating on the original teachings, expanding our knowledge about these, and it was more inward-oriented. Lodges and sections were more concerned about its membership rather than the outside world. And it may be said that for much of these 140 years, uh, we have been weak in going out to the world and bringing theosophy to the world. So we cannot help but ask the question, are we as a society becoming less and less relevant to the world, to the problems of the world that the Mahatmas sought to help solve when the society was founded? Now, it is very clear 
if we look into our original literature, the Mahatma letters, Blavatsky's writings, that the Mahatmas in founding the Theosophical Society intended this to be a movement for the world and not just for us, the members, a few thousand members. I'd like to just share with you some thoughts written by them in the Mahatma letters just to remind us about this task because while many of you are familiar with these, but it is worthwhile rem reminding ourselves about the importance of this original mission of the Theosophical Society. Probably the most important Mahatma letter that we have is what is called the Mahachohan's letter. The Mahachohan is the teacher of the Mahatmas and um, he dictated to Mahatma Kuthumi assert, uh, his thoughts which were sent to Sinet. And among, if you will only read one Mahatma letter, then read this letter because it is often considered as the charter of the Theosophical Society. In that letter, which is a very long letter, it says, for our doctrines to practically react on the so-called moral code or the ideas of truthfulness, purity, self-denial, charity, etc., we have to preach and popularize a knowledge of theosophy, or the ageless wisdom. It is not the individual and determined purpose of attaining for oneself nirvana, which is, after all, only an exalt exalted and glorious selfishness, but the self-sacrificing pursuit of the best means to lead on the right path our neighbor, to cause as many of our fellow creatures as we possibly can to benefit by it, which constitutes the true theosophist. This is not the only statement that they have said in many letters. It's repeatedly mentioned that our work is out there in the world and not simply for our membership. So I'd like to share with you some thoughts regarding what may be certain pivotal things that may be suggested regarding our work in the in this century. There are very many, as has been shown in the priority projects of the, of the strategic planning group of the General Council, but I've chosen a few which I thought we must give attention to. I'd like to share five of the many ideas. The first one is the need to globalize theosophical work. The second is the need, the urgent need, to develop and launch public programs with applied theosophy. Third is the establishment of educational institutions. Fourth is the need to increase youth membership worldwide. And the fifth is to work towards religious reforms. Let me start with the first one, because this is a very strategic facet of our work. We need to globalize theosophical work. Why globalize? I've been a member of the council for many, many years, many decades, in fact. And I've noticed that as I traveled and as I attend the council meetings, I've noted that first, sections and even lodges operate like archipelagos. And these different islands in the archipelagos work independently. We know that we are autonomous, but autonomy doesn't mean just being disjointed or separated. We can work together, but that has not been very visible for many decades, uh, probably 50, 70 years or so. We've been working too independently of each other. And as a result, when there are sections which become weak, hardly anybody is there to help them, and they just die away. There have been sections which have faded away in the theosophical map uh, because somehow they have weakened. Um, one example is in the case of uh, Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka used to be one of the strongest sections in the world not in the world perhaps, but a very strong section. Um, Alcott established more than um, so many schools over there 
that by 1920s there were about 250 schools established by the Theosophical Society, Colonel Olcott himself is now considered a national hero of this country, Sri Lanka. And there were so many lodges over there, but today it is dying and there's only one lodge there. So fortunately, the international uh, headquarters and the Indo-Pacific Federation has now agreed to help uh, uh, Sri Lanka and reinvigorate this very strong uh, section, former section. We have to remember one of our international presidents also come from Sri Lanka, C. Jinarajadasa. Now, we have to remember that if the international society as a global network is weak, then we are weak even if there are single sections which appear apparently are strong. Because worldwide, when we don't have this mutual network of support, then eventually we will all weaken. So we need to strengthen the international headquarters for synergy, for coordination. We are like a solar system where the headquarters is like the sun around which we revolve. There are three thoughts that I'd like to share with you regarding this work on the globalization of our theosophical work. The first is something which we are already doing and which has produced result. This is the annual strategic planning and review. There's something that has not been done for I don't know how long, maybe 90 years or so. And the last time I remember that there was such an effort was during the World Congress in New York in 1975. There, was, there were workshops on the future of the society but unfortunately, there were no follow-up on these. The ideas were beautiful, but no plan is useful unless it is set in, mo in motion with a timetable and with certain results. Now, this group, which has been started by the president um, since about two years ago, has become a kind of think tank of the TS. A group of people need to think about the society as a whole internationally, and what better group than the General Council? And hence, this group has been meeting for two years uh, in order to do this, just this, analyze where we are and what we'd like to do and where we are going. It expands international work with more volunteers, and hence, the people who are helping the international president would not just be limited to the people in Adyar, uh, yesterday we saw what uh, New Zealand has done for the theosophy.world, something which uh, is amazing an amazing development, but which comes from the voluntary work of mainly two persons. They're not even paid. We don't even send money to them. They just fund it by themselves. And it is a, it is a work that will make a difference in our international global work. This such a group, such an effort, will also increase synergy around the world because synergy, I believe, is very important. There are many things which a section cannot do, but in coordination with others, it can be done. I'll give an example. There have been people who have proposed the production of an encyclopedia for many, many years, since the early years of the Theosophical Society, but it has never been done until one day I saw that uh, an Australian whom I did not know made such a proposal. And at that time, I also wrote an article about the need for an encyclopedia. And so I wrote him and told him about uh, the, the uh, resonance between our thoughts. And then we met in Perth, and that was the beginning the birth of the Theosophical Encyclopedia, which was a collaboration of people from many, many countries. No single section would have been able to do this. It has to be done together with people. Another one, I think many of you know that there is a CD called Theosophical Classics, which contains all the Theosophical Classics, the 15 volume uh, work of Blavatsky, Mahatma Letters, uh, Sinet's uh, esoteric Buddhism, and so on. It's about more than 20 volumes of the classic works in one 
software, which has been very invaluable for research. Now, this could not have been possible if it were not for the synergistic cooperation between the American section and the Philippine section. On our own, we could not have done it. But with the help of the American section, this became possible. There are many such examples which have happened, but these were like isolated cases of synergistic cooperation. Why don't we make it a global effort that there is synergy all over? And this, these efforts will make a pivotal difference in the future of the TS. The second one is that internationally, through projects, we'll have to increase the budget for our international work through projects. And I put it as a primary uh, phrase over there. Now let me just uh, share with you some basic data. In 2017, the budget of the international section on the propagation of theosophy, including the international officers, is only about 4 million rupees or $58,000. Now, for a global organization in 55 or 60 countries, I think you will see that it's very small. And uh, traditionally, people have said, it's just we don't have money. Uh, how can we increase this budget and, and so on? How can we do more work? But I am convinced that the problem is not the lack of money. The problem is lack of worthwhile projects or programs because I am strongly, strongly convinced that money follows projects and not otherwise. It is not that there is money, then we set projects. But rather, because we believe in something, then money will come. Uh, when President Tim uh, became international president, he realized that there is a need to do something about the buildings in Adyar. And uh, there's no money for it. But he set it as a goal, as a program, and then money just poured in. And now this work is ongoing. I'll give some examples among other organizations just to give us an idea about this kind of possibility. In 1993, there was a small school in Bhubaneswar. Bhubaneswar is in eastern India almost Middle Eastern India. A school was established for tribal children for 125 tribal students, and the school was completely free. A very small effort. And I'd like to express my appreciation to our Vice President Deepa Padi for calling, for letting me become aware of the existence of this school. I've never heard of it. Now, from 1993, year by year, it grew, it, it went to hundreds and it went to thousands. And after just 25 years, this small school grew to 26,000 students, all living in dormitories, being fed every day, and no tuition fee, all free. Every day, this school has to serve 100,000 meals every day. How they do this is an amazing feat. Now, this school is called Kalinga Institute of Social Sciences, and you've probably not heard about it, but it is doing an amazing thing. Its annual budget today, all from donations, is 760 million rupees or 11 million dollars every year. And look at this, you know, the, the photo here. This is just one gathering. They were inviting a UN dignitary, and all the students gathered. Look at that. It is a sea of people just listening to one lecture. It's an amazing uh, accomplishment. Until I saw this, I never believed that this would have been possible in one campus. Another one. In 1922, a group of Freemasons decided to put up a hospital for crippled and burnt children in Louisiana in USA. Then it took them almost 40 years to start newer hospitals. Three more were set up in 1962, and today, they have 22 hospitals. And it's one of the biggest uh, hospitals for burnt and crippled children. It is now called the Shriners Hospitals for Crippled and Burnt Children. How much does it spend from donations alone? It spends $500 million a year. 
all free. And where does this come from? Because people were willing to donate things because they think that it's a worthy project. Last example. In 1865, 10 years before the founding of the Theosophical Society, a Protestant minister and his wife decided to preach to those of very low social status in East London, like prostitutes, beggars, alcoholics, and so on, by helping uplift them. And when people saw that this was something that was very helpful to these uh, this abandoned people, they started to volunteer and donations started coming in year after year. This became what is now called the Salvation Army. How much is its annual budget? Its annual expenditure is $3.7 billion, all from donations. I couldn't even imagine how this about, how much is it in rupees? Maybe about 500 uh, billion rupees a year. How do you gather such a huge amount every year? Now, in talking about this, I'm not, going, I'm not really dealing with comparisons with other organizations. It's not even, about, even the amount of money involved, but it's about possibilities, that these things are possible. And in all these examples, they all started with projects and not money. And when they found that something was really worthwhile, money just came in. Now, the President and General Council has identified international priority projects. And all these projects have gained support. And when these projects gain support, the budget of the TS will correspondingly grow, almost effortlessly, because people will come forward to help. Just yesterday and the other day, in our group on Theosophical Schools, already there were people who came forward to volunteer, not only to help in these efforts, but also to offer their land in order to set up schools. Amazing, in just two days of one hour's meeting, then these things became possible, which were not even mentioned or discussed before. But, there is, but it is very important that there should be a team of coordinators who will follow up these initiatives and offers to volunteer. And this, I think, is a difference that is that the present strategic planning uh, sessions are doing. The difference is that there is a follow-up team headed by our international secretary. The third one is the need to systematically train dedicated and competent theosophical workers who will do work worldwide on a global basis. Now, I had the, uh, the opportunity to visit Crotona and the American section many, many times in the past years. And one of the things that impressed me was that the American section had a training program for young theosophists on theosophy, on leadership, on being a speaker. And this was not just a one-time training, but something that was followed up year after year. Some of these people whom I knew way back are now theosophical lecturers, leaders, and resource people. And this was not done, as I said, in just one session, but something which was deliberately nurtured. I believe that we should do the same thing on an international scale, starting with ADR and then with the different federations and centers around the world. Because unless we do so, then where will our future speakers and resource people and leaders come from? Will they just come forward by accident? We, have, we must not depend on accidents, but we must deliberately plan this for the future. We need to set up curriculum, materials, methodology, and practicum or internship in such training. And in the future, I believe that we will soon uh, put up a master's degree program in theosophy as a formal way of training workers, speakers, authors, and leaders. Now, in formalizing such training, I think we need to be careful that we should ensure that we do not nurture dogmatic speakers and writers which will make theosophy another set of beliefs. I'd like to share with you on this matter something which Blavatsky has written towards the conclusion part of her very important book, The Key to Theosophy. 
this Bukita theosophy, I believe, should be part of the uh, study, uh, the books to study by every section and lodge, because it spells out in, in detail and in their essence the work of the Theosophical Society. Lovatsky said, when he was talking about theosophies to become qualified in the future as leaders, he said, I do not refer to technical knowledge of the esoteric doctrine, though that is most important. I spoke rather of the great need for which our successors in the guidance of the society, which will have of unbiased and clear judgment. Every attempt, every such attempt as the Theosophical Society has hitherto ended in failure, because sooner or later it has degenerated into a sect set up hard and fast dogmas of its own, and so lost by imperceptible degrees that vitality which living truth alone can impart. The second facet is the important need for uh, us to put out launch programs for the public, and this is applied theosophy, not courses on, on doctrinal teachings, but rather on the applications of these teachings. The TS must offer programs that will benefit the public, whether members or not members, and this is actually, as I mentioned previously, the mission of the Theosophical Society. It is not just about a philosophy or idea, it is the application of an idea or ideas. Let me just share with you some statements of the Mahatmas on this. From the Mahachohan's letter, this is familiar to most of you, but to some it may not be familiar. The Mahachohan said, To be true, religion and philosophy must offer the solution of every problem. And if our doctrines will show their competence to offer it, then the world will be the first one to confess that that must be the true philosophy, the true religion, the true light which gives truth and nothing but the truth. This is a challenge to us that if we indeed offer a viable philosophy, then it must work in every department of life. But who will show this except us? We must first set the model, set the example, and put up those applications, and then others, whether they're theosophists or not, will now see that it works, and they will also adopt it. But we must start the ball rolling. Ideas are not powerful unless they are translated into practices that can transform. And hence the practice part of it is, I think, so crucial. I believe that in the past hundred or so years, our weakness has been because we focus too much on the idea and less on the application in the outside world. Now let me just share some examples about what can be done in this direction. There are so many things that can be done but I'll just mention a few instances. I think one of the best avenues is the TOS, because it is something that is already in place. It is found in more than 30 countries worldwide. There are so many volunteers on TOS around the world, and they can make a big, big difference in the outer world, non-members, uh, in making life better and introducing something more than just feeding or food or shelter, but something more uh, involving human transformation. Let me again share with you what the Mahatmas speak about this type of work. The Mahatma K.H. wrote, The first object of the T.S. is philanthropy. The true theosophist is a philanthropist, not for himself but for the world he lives. This and philosophy the right comprehension of life and its mysteries will give the necessary basis and show the right path to pursue. Here he's pointing out one important thing. It is being a philanthropist plus having a philosophy. It is this, the right comprehension of life and its mysteries, which will give the necessary basis to show the right path to pursue. The Mahatma Kuthumi similarly wrote, Our society is not a mere intellectual school for occultism, 
and those greater than we have said that he who thinks the task of working for others is too hard had better not undertake it. The moral and spiritual sufferings of the world are more important and need help and cure more than science needs aid from us in any field of discovery. And he added something very mysterious. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. Then in the Mahachowan's letter, there was a discussion about S uh, several Europeans who wanted to be trained in occultism. And the Mahachohan did not approve of this. He's, he wrote, shall we, do, shall we not devote ourselves to teaching a few Europeans and leave the teeming millions of, ignorant, of the ignorant, of the poor, and the despised, the lowly, and the oppressed, to take care of themselves and of their hereafter as best they know how? Never. Rather perish the Theosophical Society with both its hapless founders than that we should permit it to become no better than an academy of magic, a hall of occultism. In the same letter, he said that we, the devoted followers of that spirit incarnate, of absolute self-sacrifice, of philanthropy, divine kindness, should ever allow the T.S., to represent the embodiment of selfishness, the refuge of the few with no thought in them for the many, is a strange idea, my brothers. Again and again, the same idea is being brought out. We are here, the theos is here for the world and not for ourselves. We are given seminal ideas from the Mahatmas and theosophy and the theosophical society was formed. It's small, just 25,000 members, but our work is for the teeming millions that the Mahatmas are speaking about. This small group of people must work for the larger whole. And who are our co-workers? Not just ourselves, but people with similar views and goals and ideals. They are, we have to have synergy with them, not just people within the Theosophical Society. And I put in here some slides on some of the work being done, but uh, Nancy has already given us so many other possibilities that these are just uh, repetitions of what has already been shared, like you know, women empowerment, um, yeah, education, and so on. We just need to keep in mind that TOS is not just about serving food or medical attention or giving relief to people who have physical needs. It is ultimately about human development, dignity, self-esteem, selfless service, moral development, and so on. And then we need to work together to create greater impact. Another example of what we can do for the public is to develop a meditational system, not just for ourselves, but for the general public. I've been very, um, I've admired and been very impressed by what, by what a few organizations are doing in this regard. Zen, for example, there are very few real Zen monks, and yet Zen meditation has already spread worldwide, helping millions of people, including business people, in becoming more calm, more peaceful, more effective in their life without becoming Zen monks. Uh, Transcendental meditation is another example. Then vipassana is another example. The workers are very few, but have reached millions of people. Why can't we do the same thing? We are all convinced that meditation is a core practice in the spiritual life, in the theosophic life, and in the life of an ordinary person. So why can't we do something about this and make it our, a very major work of service to other people? Another one which has been mentioned is a self-transformation seminar. The idea is that we, we bridge the link between the idea and daily life. Marriage, parenting, social, social conflicts, and so on. 
and we need to work on the transformation of individuals in order to make them become effective, harmonious, and peaceful in relationship to the world. Another example is to public magazines on applied theosophy. For members, we can talk about browns and races and uh, buddhimanas and so on, but for the public, we have to have magazines that will apply these ideas in their daily lives. We have very few public magazines today, and I would um, strongly suggest that in all the languages, in all the countries, try to have public magazines, even if it is e-magazines, not actual physical magazines, but let us try to convert theosophical ideas into practical, usable uh, practices in the lives of people. Then we are starting our work in our own respective societies to make theosophy a living philosophy. The third one is part of TOS work and also partly by TS. It is the establishment of schools. The key to the future, not just the theosophical society, but of the world, is in our young children and youth. And when they change, the world changes. And the most powerful institution to influence the young is the school system. It is more powerful than parents. It is more powerful than media. When it is well designed, when it is well established, and then it is it, it, it spreads around, then it can determine the future of entire societies. I come from a Catholic country, the Philippines. Uh, the Philippines is 95% Christian and 85% Catholics. It is because of the power of the educational institutions in the Philippines that the, that the world view of the majority of people and the legislators in the Philippines uh, has been molded by the values of the church, of the Catholic church. So as an example of such an influence, the Philippines is the only country in the world that has no divorce outside of Vatican. It is the only country. Rome, where Vatican is, ha has divorce and everywhere else. And why don't we have divorce? Because of the Catholic Church. Uh, the use of contraceptives has been, the, the bill in Congress has long been there for many, many years, but could not be passed because of the influence of the church. Four, there are four top universities in the Philippines. Only one is a state university. The other three are Catholic universities. The leaders, the legislators of the country come from these many institutions. You can realize how much influence these institutions can have in the formation of the worldviews of every society and every country. And if you want the ageless wisdom, even if you don't call it theosophy, it doesn't matter. If you want the ageless wisdom to have such an enduring influence in society and in the world, we must establish schools and influence the world's educational systems. We may not, even other schools, which we are not running, we can help influence how they run their schools. I'd like to share with you this important statement of Blavatsky in the key to theosophy, which I've shared with some of you before, but it is worth repeating. She said, if we had money, we would found schools. Children should ob above all be taught self-reliance, love for all men, altruism, mutual charity, and more than anything else, to think and reason for themselves. We would endeavor to deal with each child as a unit and to educate it so th as to produce the most harmonious and equal unfoldment of its powers in order that its special aptitudes should find their full natural development. We should aim at creating free men and women, free intellectually, free morally, unprejudiced in all respects and above all things, unselfish. And we believe that much, if not all of this, could be obtained by proper and truly theosophical education. The fourth area is to draw young people to theosophy. I've been traveling in many countries around the world, uh, especially to theosophical sections, and I've noticed 
that in most countries, most sections, the average age is very high. In one country we recently visited, or in three sections we recently visited, the average age of the audience is about 65 years old. And there in the audiences, we could hardly find a single person below 40. Now, one of the sections uh, was already giving up its big headquarters because no one was taking over, no new leadership. In other words, they themselves felt that their work is dying. That's very, very sad because we have a vibrant, a living philosophy given by no less than the adepts themselves. And yet, we, we seem not to be doing a very good work with this, with this treasure that we have. So we need to attend to, the, to drawing young people to theosophy. The traditional dissemination approaches seem not to be reaching young people effectively. And we need to give rein to young people to experiment with their own approaches. And we need to sometimes stand back as the elders and let do their work, even if it fails sometimes, it's okay, but let them try it because they may have better ideas in making theosophy relevant to the world. Now, I may just would like to mention that during this Congress, I've met many of the Singaporean members and I find that many of you are young members. Now, there's something that you are doing here in Singapore that we can learn from. Maybe you can write about it, uh, Sane, about it because it, you may have the solution to the problem of many, many sections uh, who are, which are dwindling. And uh, in your case, it's not happening, it's the opposite seems to be happening. The fifth area that I would give emphasize, emphasis to is to work for religious reforms. History has shown the harm that popular religion has brought about to the world, inquisitions, wars, terrorism, hatred, genocide, intolerance, and so on. Do you know what's the longest war in history? The longest war. It's the Crusades. It's the war between the Christians and the Muslims. It lasted for 200 years. One of the most cruel institutions in history is the Inquisition, as an institution of the church. And one of the worst forms of violence that we witness today is religious terrorism. Something that we have never seen before. Political terrorism does not bomb public places. They just bomb military installations or government uh, buildings, but never the general public. But religious terrorism, it is happening. Now, the Mahatma Cage has strongly pointed out this letter 88 in the Mahatma letters. He has strongly pointed out that two-thirds of the evils of the world come from this kind of religion. While the Mahatmas, the Mahachowan, speaks about the importance of mysticism in religions, but when it comes to this popular religion, it is doing more harm than help. He says that one-third of the evils of the world come from human selfishness, but two-thirds come from this outer form of religion. The belief in anthropomorphic gods have made people slaves to sacerdotal priesthood. And the Mahatma Kesh said, wrote, our chief aim is to deliver humanity of this nightmare, to teach man virtue for its own sake, and to walk in life relying on himself instead of leaning on a theological crutch that for countless ages was the direct cause of nearly all human misery very strong statements, were it not because it was written by a madma, I would probably give uh, strong credence to it. But having been written by someone whom I believe knows far broader, deeper uh, insights about human history and development, then we have to look into this as theosophical workers. Mahatma K. H., as well as the Mahachon's letter, has also said something which is very important. They have said, the Theosophical Society was chosen as the cornerstone, the foundation of the future religions of humanity. 
what is it? What is our role in doing this? And are we doing it? Um, in our work in religions, sometimes we try to point out that all religions are actually one. They teach about the same things. Now, I think that when we do not, when we look at this superficially, we are actually not helping uh, bring about true oneness of religions. If we look at religions on the outer level, there is no unity. And in fact, there can never be unity. If you look into the scriptures, especially of the Abrahamic religions, a single quote from any of them would show you that compatibility of the religions would almost be impossible. It is on the deeper level, the Mahachowan spoke of the mystical level, that there is unity. But it's a small section of religious knowledge in the world. Majority, 99% of the world knows only about this outer religion, but not of this inner religion. This, I believe, is where our work is. We have to popularize this inner part of religion, popularize mysticism as the core of religious experience, but also point out the religious superstitions, incongruences, and divisiveness. I believe that we must not be too careful about this, meaning we, uh, we are too shy to do so because read the works of Blavatsky and you will see how, how unrestrained she is when it comes to the need for rela religious reform. We also need to focus on ethics as, as one of the most important foundation stones of religion. One other aspect is freedom. There are some religions today, a few, true, who, which do not impose dogmas on their adherents. And these are the forerunners of the future religions of the world because dogma is based on a fixed belief system and imposed upon people. But the future religions of the world, I believe, is something which is based on the search for truth. Even if such quest will go against the dogmas, the pre-existing dogmas of churches. So we need to help bring about a world where religions foster non-sectarian spirituality and mysticism. The Dalai Lama once spoke, he said that there are two kinds of spirituality. The first kind is sectarian spirituality, and the second kind is non-sectarian spirituality. Sectarian spirituality would be in terms of the cultural language of a particular religion, and it turns off other people. And if we don't want division in the world among religions, we must promote non-sectarian spirituality. We have to foster love instead of intolerance, exclusivity, hatred, or violence. These are the five areas which I think, among many other things, we need to give attention to. To globalize theosophical work, to have public programs on applied theosophy, the establishment of educational institutions as widely as we can, the increase of youth membership worldwide, and to work towards religious reform. Let me just conclude with a thought by Madame Blavatsky on the future of the Theosophical Society. Again, this is from the Key to Theosophy. She wrote, the Theosophical Society, if we do our work well, the Theosophical Society will gradually leaven and permeate the great mass of thinking and intelligent people with its large-minded and noble ideas of religion, duty, and philanthropy. Slowly but surely, it will burst asunder the iron fetters of creeds and dogmas, of social and caste prejudices. It will break down racial and national antipathies and barriers and will open the way to the practical realization of the brotherhood of all men. Then she says, if the Theosophical Society survives and lives true to its mission, to its original impulses through the next hundred years. Tell me, I say, if I go too far in asserting that the earth will be a heaven in the 21st century in comparison with what it is now. Are we in heaven? If not yet, we have not yet done our work. Let us do our work 
and this is our duty. Good morning to all of you. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I think that's a splendid talk to end our Congress on, don't you agree? It's given us an awful lot to think about, and uh, let's hope we can take the Theosophical Society forward um, so that we can live up to the um, ideals of set out for us by the uh, masters. So, uh, Vic, thank you very, very much indeed for a wonderful talk.